Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections, and we're going to ask weather. Um, this means, this being the war in Israel, whether it means the end of life on the kibbutz. And for this discuss discussion, we have Carl Ackerman. He's a, an educator and an historian, and he has spent time on kibbutzim. So we have to ask him about life on kibbutzim in his generation and what it means in the current, the current situation. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thanks for coming down. Oh, Jay, always a pleasure. Pleasure you mentioned you. <laughs> so, Carl, tell us tell us about your life on the kibbutz. Um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of Americans, have spent a little time on the kibbutz because it's such an ideal way of spending life. It sort of it clears your head somehow, and it makes you understand the relationship of uh, people and agriculture and the soil. Uh, and making the desert bloom. There is nothing so satisfying um, as making the desert bloom. Tell us about your experience. Well, Jay, you know, I was at Kibbutz Zorah, which is, you know, I would say maybe five or six miles, maybe a, bit, a little bit longer outside of Jerusalem. And um, as you have mentioned to me in a previous conversation, of course, most Kibbutzim, kibbutzim um, are um, at the plural of uh, uh, Kibbutz, um, are uh, agricultural in nature. Um, my particular kibbutz was actually had agricultural crops growing, but also um, was produced uh, livestock, and in this case, turkeys. And um, uh, in addition, there was a factory um, that was worked in by both Palestinians in Israel and Jews in Israel, you know, very friendly times. And they made both um, chairs, you know, chairs for offices, et cetera, and um, scooters, bicycle scooters. I think they attached um, motors uh, to bicycles. And of course, the kibbutz, uh, every single kibbutz has people on it that are you know, predominantly very well educated. Most of them believe in some form of socialism. Um, the kibbutz uh, uh, movement in Israel, most people are very, as I said, liberal or to the left. And they believe even in a Palestinian state um, and most of most of the people, and um, it's it's sort of like uh, socialism, and on a small scale, come to Israel. Although, in in in, in as uh, kibbutzim have progressed from the early part of the 20th century to the current period, you know, most of them believe now in in capitalist principles. But for example, in at Zorah, the um, factory that all the um, uh, all the profits would be shared communally with the, with the people on the kibbutz and also people who were not living on the kibbutz, primarily Palestinians. Um, so, you know, but it was a, an example of just a wonderful place to live. And because of reparations from Germany, they had a fleet of like BMWs that one can drive communally. And originally, all the kids would eat together, not in their family house, in their family apartments, but they would eat together and sometimes sleep together. But by the time I got there in the early 80s, you know, kids were returning to their, their own apartments and things like this. But it was an absolutely delightful experience. And because, I don't know, they picked me out, maybe because I was Jewish, because there are a lot of volunteers from all over the world. One of my best friends was a, a German woman. Another good friend was an English man. And uh, uh, they took me with what were called the Sabra, the uh, indigenous Israelis. And we took care of turkeys. And that meant... Um, you know, going into the turkey cages, and you know, the turkeys were sold primarily for exports, and you'd have to basically take a shower before you went in, and a shower when you came out three times a day, because you didn't want to give the turkeys germs, and um, and they you didn't want them to give you germs, and so it was a very you know, I was never so, so showered. And here's the story I wanted to tell you, Jay, and I'll I'll have other stories, but we're going to go on to more serious topics. Is one day I was out and I was uh, near the cages and I was just, it was so hot. And so I went into the sprinkling system near the, uh, near the cages and all my Israeli friends broke up in laughter because I was getting wet and, you know, and I was just saying, hey, what's wrong with you guys? Don't you like to get wet? It's hot. They said, Carl, that's non-potable water. So I was having my little bath with sewer water. <laughs> ah, the Israelis. <clears throat> Yeah, they're they're fun. They're very alive, the Israelis. But I, I recall a couple of things that I want to confirm with you. Um, number one is uh, yes, a lot of the kibbutzim uh, are um, agricultural, and that is one reason why the produce 
in Israel and exported from Israel is so good. Uh, you know, you want to look for an orange. Wow, they got the best oranges ever. And um, I remember uh, yogurt, uh, which is also a product of some of those kibbutzim. The yogurt is world class, best best yogurt ever. And that goes for a lot of um, you know agricultural production in the in the kibbutzim. Um, the other thing I want to uh, remember with you is that they are in remote places. Uh, a friend of mine lives in a kibbutz, and um, it's in a remote place. And if you use Google Maps, I'm not sure Google Maps is available right now in the context of this war. But at the time it was available, the time I looked, and um, you know, I could essentially drive down the road on Google Maps, and it was really remote. There was nothing there. And it was in the middle of the desert. Um, and they made the desert bloom, you know, around the kibbutz. It was green and and, and productive and so forth, and full of, um, you know, crops. But to get there, you had to go through the desert, and you can see miles of, of scrap land. So, uh, and finally, my recollection is that uh, a lot of these kibbutz, and not only uh, being in remote places, they are near the border. Um, and um, they're, they're there for, I guess, a reason way back, you know, even before the War of Independence since 1948. Um, they were put there so that uh, it demarks the border, as a lot of things in Israel attempt to demark the border. So um, this puts them in a, in a position of, um, um, you know, uh, uh, of vulnerability. Because if you're near the border, then people come over the border and they want to attack you. And in fact, the kibbutz that I'm talking about was built in the 20s and the 30s, and it was it was underground. <clears throat> it was uh, built underground for safety. People lived, slept, ate, work, worked underground for many years. And even to this day, uh, some of the facilities in the kibbutz are underground. Now, I imagine that uh, some of the, you know, kibbutzim and, and the life on the kibbutz has changed. It's become more family-oriented rather than, you know, have the children play with each other and eat and sleep with each other. I thought that was really charming, and it created a tremendous social experience. I think it, in many ways it defines the Israeli personality, at least the personality off the kibbutz, because they are so open. And, and they got that way by dealing shoulder to shoulder with other kids. Uh, and not necessarily their parents. Parents can be oppressive. And so here they had some time with their parents, but they also had time with the community. Okay? And I think it's changed. I think it's more middle class. Their, their homes are more middle class, more, you know, more, again, more vulnerable. And that's what happened in those, uh, you know, in those um, communities uh, south of Ashkelon, uh, where they were attacked on, on October 7th, uh, horribly. So here we, and, and right now, those kibbutzim south of Ashkelon have been evacuated. There's nobody there. And even if there were somebody there, they've been essentially destroyed. Um, the, those who attacked them burned them down, uh, shot everything up, you know, did everything they could to destroy not only the people and the children and the grandparents, but the community itself, the physical community. And so it's kind of a message, isn't it, that if you live in a community like that, a kibbutz, even a modern-day kibbutz, um, there isn't a whole lot to protect you. I recall one story on uh, Israeli TV. I don't think this was on non-Israeli TV because there has been a major differentiation over the past uh, several days about what you see on Israeli TV and what you see on cable. Different, not the same. Um, but this was a story of a family that somehow survived. And how did they survive? They had a, they had an armored room in their home, and it was the children's room. And the idea is that in the case of a, an attack, an emergency, the children would stay put, and the parents would go into the children's room and lock the door, which was all, you know, um, uh, you know, strengthened, and they survived was quite remarkable that they survived. Um, and that's the way that's the way they achieved some some level of security. So the question I put to you, Carl, I mean I know that in the in the ideal, in the in the in the historic, 
um, in the in the concept, the theoretical concept of a kibbutz. It's a beautiful idea, beautifully implemented for many years. Um, now you have to wonder. I mean, there's one piece I saw on Israeli TV where they said, you know, our kids will never be the same because they're always going to be looking around to see if some some Arab with a machine gun pops up, you know, whack them all. He's there, he's there, he's there. And so these kids get a little paranoid, maybe a lot paranoid, that there'll be an attack um, on them as they are on the kibbutz. So my question to you is, is the model of the kibbutz, where it's located, how it functions, how it protects itself, is it still viable? You know, I would say um, a short answer is not in the current situation um, of the way they're set up. There has to be much more security. Does that, do I think uh, the probably the number of uh, kibbutzim in, um, in Israel are close to about 220 with roughly about 125,000 people? Will they, um, will people not go back to them? I think they will go back to them, but I think there will be heavy security. I remember um, in Los Angeles, I was intrigued by a school, Jewish school called Heschel West. And uh, they had um, actual Israeli guards around the school, especially, you know, after 9-11 and after um, there had been attacks uh, by terrorists on Jewish schools. And I think that will become, I think the security consciousness of this will be, um, will be uh, much higher. But I think that the, the impulse to have this kind of shared experience that really replicates the early you know, before Israel was even born, you know, the early 20th century notion of the kibbutzim um, were uh, is, is so strong that per perhaps it will survive. In addition, you know, it's often the kibbutzim uh, graduates, the kids that grow up and become, you know, really elite members of the uh, Israeli Defense Forces. They've worked so hard. You know, they go from their, like the old farmers in, in the Midwest of the United States, you know, they go from the farm into the, into the classroom. And, um, I think, and I, you know, I'm projecting here um, greatly, Jay, so forgive me for this, but I think that there's a, a really wonderful um, school system that's begun in Israel over the past like 20 years, and it's called Hand in Hand. And what this school district, what these schools do when they're spreading throughout Israel is they train Jews, Arabs, and, and Palestinians um, uh, together in their education. So they become friends, uh, they have shared experiences. They know all three languages. And um, <clears throat> the only solution, you know, long term to a lot of um, some of the problems um, um, that we've seen with Hamas, I think, is this kind of education. More, if there's education like that in the kibbutzim, um, I, I think uh, this would all be great. Now, let me just make a few comments about what we recently saw in one kibbutz is that, you know, as I see demonstrations across the Arab world, I mean, I understand, um, you know, people's concern about other people, but I think one has to recognize that this all began with Hamas and its complete um, utter depravity and its killing of innocent people. And, you know, and killing of innocent people who are for a two-state solution, I may add, including the, 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 peace, uh, the, the peace festival. I mean, you know, what in, in the world and I think what we need is before people in the Arab world go out and demonstrate, which I think you know, demonstrations are good and they're concerned about the people um, in Gaza. I think that's all well and good. Uh, but they first have to condemn what happened. Um, you know, they have to say, look, this is terrible. These these leaders do not represent us. And of course, there were demonstrators celebrating this in different parts of the Arab world. And I think that's the great mistake that people have to be humane and they have to you know um really consider uh why this all began and um but going back to the original question um you know the uh, what what attracted me about zora in particular is that you know they had a bomb shelter well when there wasn't a war going on or you know any kind of uh people would go down there and dance which i did and there you know it was before i was married and there were these young beautiful um, Israeli women who were my age, and they were all in green fatigues, and they put down their Uzis and they dance. And I thought, isn't this wonderful uh, to have such strong women here 
who are fighting in the IDF and, um, you know, can do so many multiple things that are truly equal with men. And, um, you know, that that was just, it was just wonderful. And it was, you know, isn't it nice to go when you're, when you're finished with work during the day, you went to the cafeteria and you were served really good food and you didn't have to make it. I mean, it was sort of like a really idyllic um, experience, you know? And, you know, it was, you lived, you know, I mean, you had your own separate apartment, but you, you lived communally with a lot of other people. It was, it was kind of, a, you know, restored the neighborhood because the na- your neighbors are all part of your uh, kibbutzniks, you know, they're, they're, they're your fellow travelers in life. Anyway, I spoke too much, Jay. I'm sure you have other questions, though. No, but it reminds me of my own experience as a kid where I went to a Jewish uh, Federation camp in the Catskills every summer, and it was run like that. It was a community experience, and it was really one of the best experiences I've had. And this Kibbutz experience you had, it's similar. Uh, one of the best life experiences you ever had in dealing with people and being close to them and in sharing um, and in, you know, finding this sort of common humanity, this, uh, this common love of life. That's what it is. So, you know, there were 19,000 people every day uh, that entered Israel uh, from, uh, from the Gaza Strip. And um, my guess is that they were working uh, in these kibbutz communities, one job or another. And it was a source of cash for them. They go home in the evening and, you know, bring home the cash. And there are not a lot of jobs in Gaza. So this was really a, a benefit. That's not going to happen anymore. Okay? Um, you also talk about uh, the fact that not everybody in the kibbutz is Jewish. Some of them are not. Some of them are Europeans. Some of them are Arabs. And more and more over the years, you know, the mix of Jews and Arabs uh, has 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 increased. Uh, there are more Arabs living in Jewish communities, and I, I suppose you could say there are more Jews in Arab communities. Although I'm I'm really not sure of that. Um, <clears throat> bottom line is that the diversity of the kibbutz life, at least up to a point, uh, was valuable. And uh, just as in my summer camp, you know, there was diversity there, and so you got to meet people who were not necessarily on the same page. Um, so a great democratic experience. No surprise that it creates liberal thinkers. No surprise that it creates critical thinkers. No surprise that it creates um, people who want to see the best the best things happen in the world for humanity. No surprise that. But query, you know, would you go back now, given the danger? And let me identify the danger I'm talking about. Um, this, you know, a lot of people say that this war we have now was lost on October 7th when they we found that they were able to do what they did, the massacres. It was so horrible that nothing Israel could do uh, could actually make up for that. No matter how vengeful uh, Netanyahu felt and no matter what language he used, um, it was already a disaster on October 7th. Never, ever to be forgotten. Like 9-11, but worse for a smaller country like that. <clears throat> and so this changes the way things work. Some people say that the end of this war, Netanyahu has to go, um, not only for his uh, political machinations, but also um, you know, for his, his lack of security for all these outlying areas, um, like the ones that were attacked um, on October 7th. And uh, things will change. You know, every war brings change. We had a show earlier today where World War II changed um, the way the British uh, civil service works. Um, it was not so good before the war, Second World War, but after it was way better. Um, it, it, it sort of had to clean itself up. Uh, it had to change. It had to reform. It had to be more efficient. Okay, And the same thing here. I suggest to you that Israel will change, hopefully soon. Hopefully the end of this war will come soon. Hopefully the end of this war will allow the survival of Israel. As that's not entirely certain with all these various, um, you know, attacks from uh, various fronts. But let's assume after the war, we take another look. We look at the way Israel is configured. We look at the way these uh, kibbutzes, uh, kibbutzim, and agricultural communities are structured. We look at the way security is done. I mean, those places that were attacked were so open. 
um, there was really very little security there. There was nobody standing around with a gun um, and, you know, sworn to defend those kids, those people. Um, and they didn't. And they were, it was such an easy target. Um, that can't happen again. Certainly, we have to have security. Anyone, any rational human being would have to have security because the success of the attack um, on uh, October 7th begets the possibility that it will happen again. Um, you know, anything like that, if it's successful, it's a lesson to the people who did it. Yes, they can do that. Yes, it can happen again. Um, and so I, I'd be very worried if I lived on or had the opportunity to live on a kibbutz. And I would want to have lots of security. But security costs money. You know, to have somebody standing around with a gun and uh, or a tower with binoculars, what have you, or set up some kind of uh, radar system to watch people coming out of Gaza and, or any other border area, um, that costs money. It costs money in terms of the labor. It costs money in terms of the equipment. And it costs something else, too. It costs vigilance. Vigilance, let me go on record. Vigilance costs money. Vigilance is expensive. And vigilance taxes you. You know that carefree time in the bomb shelter where you were dancing and you put your Uzi down and all that? And it's <laughs> over. You can't do that anymore. Um, vigilance makes for a different kind of life. So to the extent, my view, and I'm interested in yours, of course, uh, my view is the model that we have been describing uh, of a kibbutz cannot exist going forward. This is such a tremendous loss. It's, it's a loss in terms of the agricultural production. It's a loss in terms of the education and the human, the human graduates that come out of kibbutzim. Uh, it's, it's a loss of the Israeli attitude, you know, the special Israeli qualities of, um, you know, creativity and focus and all that that you always see in every Israeli. So um, Israel has to lose that. It cannot continue this way. It's simply too expensive on a human level and on an economic level. Your thoughts? Well, you know, Jay, I think that some of the policing and some of, you know, I mean, Israel has really become a tech giant. And so maybe that can happen. And as I said, you know, what I would like to see coming out of this is the kibbutzim movement uniting with hand in hand um, and really becoming centers of you know, cooperation uh, between Jews and Arabs and uh, Palestinians. And they're, they're very successful in doing this in hand in hand. It takes a long time, it takes families to trust one another. Um, but I think um, that's, that's one thing. Second of all, I wanted to mention today, because I was able to watch the president's speech. And again, um, which was first uh, illuminated on this program between you and me, uh, we talked about the Biden doctrine. And once again, uh, Joe Biden is advocating for democracy, hence his money for Ukraine and also Israel at the same time. He does not want to put American lives at stake and boots on the ground. That's number two. And number three, he talked about anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, you know, which is, you know, the third pillar of the Biden doctrine, which is, you know, against, you know, uh, um, suggesting that there's no room in America for any form of hatred, especially against an ethnic group, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to return to Hawaii for a second. When I took my kibbutz, my tour, I was sponsored by the Jewish Federation. And I want to mention one school in particular. Iolani School allowed me to go. The uh, assistant headmaster there was a guy named Charlie Proctor, who put the Jewish holidays on the, you know, and, and of course, Iolani is Episcopalian, um, on the calendar. Um, he allowed me to come back to school a couple of weeks late, which, you know, other teachers are going, hey, where's Ackerman? You know? <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, it was such a, such a wonderful thing. And, you know, it's, it, as we were talking about, you know, you with your um, education and, and Jewish summer camps and my experience on the kibbutz, you know, it's such a wonderful thing. And I, I, I really thought that, I was working for a man who was very generous. I mean, he's long retired, Charlie Proctor, but, you know, what a wonderful school. And I always felt with the leadership at the time, who was an Episcopal minister named uh, David Kuhn, I always felt that that school was a school, you know, that, you know, to use the phrase about the righteous gentles, Gentiles, uh, not Gentiles, but righteous Gentiles, they were really quite 
um, wonderful. And you know, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't sense, you know, an ounce of anti-Semitism. I thought that people were very pro um, diversity at that school. And you know, now it's that school as you and I talked about that's offering, you know, one of the first African American studies classes uh, through Russell Motter. But anyway, I wanted to point out that the Jew, the my trip was only possible with the help of the of the Jewish community here, the Jewish Federation. Um, I, I think this was before that wonderful program that allows young people to go to Israel. I'm trying to remember the name of it. I don't know why I'm forgetting it right now. Um, and uh, and also because of the really uh, generous uh, Charlie Proctor and Iolani School. I'm so grateful to Iolani for that experience. I want to go back and answer my own question. <laughs> my question was, um, you know, can we still have kibbutzim? I think or, we can. Or, it is, or it, is it over? Okay, and I think there'd be a lot of people that would say it's over. Forget about it. On the other hand, there are some real benefits in maintaining the community art form. And I'll tell you what I think. Number one is uh, the Israelis were right to put them in remote areas and make the desert bloom, remote areas along the borders and demonstrate that, yes, you can make the desert bloom. Uh, I think the Israelis were right in putting them together in a social experience and having everybody benefit, benefit by the experience and the education involved and um, creating a, a, a group of people that had strength and, um, and sensitivity. Um, and I don't think that Israel wants to lose that. I don't think Israel wants to lose the agricultural production. I think, as you said, Israel has the ability technologically to defend itself on these kibbutzim. Maybe some of them have to go more underground. Some of them have to have more sophisticated mm, uh, sensors to determine if, if there are people who are coming to attack them. Um, and of course, they have to have weapons. And, and they have to have people who are mm, the soldiers. Uh, who who are sworn to defend them in the case of an attack. But it's part, I think, of the Israeli character to have these kibbutzim. Even if there are few of them, or fewer of them, uh, I, I suggest that it's worth it um, for the government to have that. It's also, and I guess this is my, my, my larger point, <clears throat> it's a statement of resilience. Yes, you blew us up north of uh, Gaza. You you killed fourteen hundred people in the most awful, humane, inhumane way. But we're here. We're here. We're alive. <laughs> we believe in our own culture. We believe in in being liberal and open. We believe in educating our kids and and having um, this kind of communal life, which is so productive together and so nutritious together, um, which is such a, a part of Israel. We're not giving it up. And come watch. Come watch as we show you our resilience. What do you think? I think, I think you hit it right on the head. And um, it reminds me of um, what my um, mother, who recently passed, said about um, when you toast. You know, Jews toast to Lahaim, you know, to life. Most people say to your health, but, you know, Jews say to you, you know, life. And as you just pointed out, I mean, this proves to the entire world, uh, the kibbutzim, that um, that uh, life will continue. Um, Israelis will remain strong and vibrant. And I, and they'll make the desert bloom, which I, which I'm quoting you here, um, which is just a beautiful, I mean, what a, what a wonderful concept, you know, make the desert bloom. Yeah, and the other aspect is... Um... It's more dangerous. Life in Israel, in the cities also, it's more dangerous. But it's the price you, you pay uh, to be Israeli, to be in uh, the Israeli democracy, the, the is Israeli society, the Israeli culture. To be a, a Jew in Israel, you pay a price of, of safety, or maybe not so safe as it was. And I think to to survive in their hearts, they have to, they have to do this. 
Well, okay, um, Carl, that was a great discussion. Thank you so much for coming on. Do you have any final words you want to leave with people? I mean, how should the people of Hawaii see this? I mean, I think that was a great story about Iolani and, um, you know, your trip. But what would you leave with the people in Hawaii who are watching this show and trying to understand how life was and is in Israel on the Kibbutzim? I think that they, you know, um, as my uncle-in-law did, um, I think they should go and visit, you know, when things are calmer, they should go and visit Israel and see, you know, it's a place of, of many religions. And to experience, you know, you talk about your tour going to different kibbutzim. I, I think that's a great way to see um, Israel. And um, for those of Jewish ancestry, I remember the name of the program. It's called Birthright um, that my nieces went to. And one of my daughters is too old for it now, but I'm urging my other daughter to go on, on Birthright, you know, to kind of explore um, what Israel means. And um, I, I think by traveling there, the seeing that, you know, Jay, you're always amazed by the by the geography because you're so close to everything. You know, in other words, it's not like you have a big buffer, like you're going across, you know, the giant Midwest or the Buffalo Rome. I mean, you know, it's you know the, the size of one of the you know Eastern small, you know, like Rhode Island, you know, or Connecticut. You know, I mean, it's like there's not much land there, and so you know, it's it's a very um, small um, but important uh, place. And you know, I I guess. I would come back to what our president said. And, you know, we have to, in Hawaii and in the rest of the United States, make sure that we try mm -hmm. to uh, bring tensions down. Um, I, I think it, uh, hopefully at some point there'll be both a, uh, the state of Israel and a Palestinian state. And my hope is, my hope, long-term hope, is that Palestinians and Jews will create some great economic sphere so that they'll be brothers in arms for the rest of, and sisters in arms, I should say, not to be just male, um, you know, for, for the future. That's my hope. It's possible, but it's not that close, I think, because um, the, you know, the Palestinians don't want any part of the Jews and they can't live with the Jews. Um, and it's very hard for people to work together if they hate each other. And especially the Palestinians who are sworn to hate and raised to hate, you know. And remember, Hamas, the you know the the constitution, if you will, the founding documents of Hamas um, state in so many words that they're dedicated to destroying the state of Israel. Likewise, um, Iran dedicated to destroying the state of Israel and every last Jew. I don't know how people can live that way, but certainly it's not healthy. Um, well, and, and then, and go ahead. I, and I think there are Israeli Palestinians who live differently. And I think that the people in hand in hand, that's why I'm very hopeful. I mean, if people want to put their money into something that is really wonderful, it's the hand in hand schools where Palestinians, Jews, and Arabs get along, you know, really well. As they, you know, I mean, if you live in a, in a community in the United States and there's Jews and there's Arabs and, you know, and, you know, uh, some of the biggest proponents of non um, um, uh, hatred against Islam are, are Jewish people, and same with Islamic people against you know anti-Semite stuff. You know, it's it's you, know, you just have to have a thriving economic community, and um, as we say, no more of this uh, mishigas, this craziness. Yeah, well, let me let me add one thought um, that, that there are a number. I mean, uh, uh, what is it? Roughly uh, two million uh, Arabs living within. Uh, 8 million people in Israel, okay, 6 million Jews. And if they go to school, they get to be doctors, lawyers, the Arabs, and they participate in the economy, and they get along. And they belong to the same business organizations, social organizations, but it's not enough. It's a question of degree. And, and then you also want them to speak out and say, I'm happy with my life here in Israel. I'm happy that I got to go to school and become a professional, become a successful businessman. Will you guys please watch me? I'm a good example of that. Fact. We, we can do this. Uh, how about stopping with the attacks? Because, uh, you know, five wars, and it was always the Palestinians attacked the Jews every time. So the other thing is tourism, um, and that is um, that, um, you know, this is certainly going to help uh, hurt, hurt the Israeli economy to have 360,000, uh, you know, citizen, citizen troops on the border for how long? It's already 13, 14 days. 
um, <clears throat> and uh, we we can't go on like this and and still have an economy in Israel. We we've got to send them back to their jobs, um, and so this is really damaging. I don't think it means the same, you know, in Arab communities and Palestinian. They don't have jobs anyway. They don't have businesses in these places. Um, but but these all these you know young soldiers have jobs in businesses in cities and what and kibbutzim and and so um, we really have to get them back into the economy soon. Uh, anyway, I wanted to say that you you have you have tourism. People come from all over the world, have come from all over the world to observe and participate in the Israeli miracle. Okay, and 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 they're tourists, and it's a great, you know, experience. I mean, the Christian community in this country, uh, you know, sends an enormous number of tourists to Israel so they can see the holy places, the holy Christian places. Okay, it's it's a fabulous experience. I mean, no matter what side of the fence you're on, um, I don't think there's a whole lot of tourism going on right now. The rockets maybe, but not a lot of tourism. So we have to get back to that. Two, and I'm just one more story, and that is uh, one of my godchildren went to Israel with a bunch of her friends, and um, this is a few years ago, and it was right around the time that there were uh, there were attacks, you know, terror attacks in the cities. And I remember they they blew up a market in the middle of the day with all the people in it. It was terrible, and uh, I said to her, "What you know? Why would you go?" It takes a certain amount of courage to go into a what amounts to a war zone where you could be in that market and get blown up. You know, you didn't do anything wrong. You happen to be very liberal about it, but you could be blown up. They don't. The bomb doesn't ask you if you're a liberal. The bomb doesn't ask you whether you believe in a two-state solution. It blows you up and kills you. And that, of course, happened in, on October 7th. And um, what I got out of it, though, Carl, is that She's courageous. She goes to Israel. She carries with her a certain amount of courage, just like Joe Biden. He goes to Israel. He carries with him a certain amount of courage. He could have been assassinated and okay. took that risk. I give him credit. I give her credit. And I think tourists have to build that in. You go to Israel. It's like, uh, you know, in, in, the Jew, in the Hebrew, the Aliyah. You go to see what the place is like to rub shoulders with all that you and I have discussed um, and to have some of that. But you pay the price of risk and you have to have courage. So it's part of the tourist experience. <laughs> well, Jay, just to, for my conclusion, I think, you know, Mar Martin Luther King had that, I, I have a dream. And my dream for Israel is that in the Arab world, they will be saying Shalom. And in the Jewish world, they'll be saying, Salam Malikum, and of course the answer is Malikum Salam, and I, I, you know, I hope that does, and I think really the organization that does this masterfully is hand in hand. I'm so encouraged by this educational group, and hopefully, um, what's happening now will not destroy all their wonderful educational efforts because it produces, you know, families and kids that grow up together, and I think that's the only way in the long term that you're going to solve a lot of these a lot of these issues and i mean you know and uh, the irony is you know in terms of you know uh, you know uh, ethnic and, and heritage is i mean we're all semites together so i mean you know, it's like we're all semitic so you know I mean, it's just kind of i mean from a from a sort of a biological viewpoint it's sort of weird you know it's all this all this fighting and stuff like this so it's um, but, uh, you know, hopefully there'll be uh, hope in the future. I know that you, Jay, and I were great believers in law and um, and, and the following of law will uh, be optimistic about uh, the future of the world for our children and grandchildren. <laughs> and you have to maintain that, that optimism, that resilience, because along the way, Carl, there'll be more attacks, mm -hmm. there'll be more terrorism, there'll be more killings, useless, senseless, savage, brutal outrageous attacks and you can't let that deter this process you have described it's got to happen and maybe over time it'll 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 become less 
Thank you, Carl. Carl Ackerman, Dr. Carl Ackerman, educator, historian, and kibbutznik. Thank you very much. <laughs> you, thank you. You're always wonderful, Jay. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha.